And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming Fires of Athelin, a, ra a radical look at blowing up D20. The one and only Ian Capel. How are you doing today, man? I'm great, mate. I'm great, mate. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, well, with that of FOA, or, of FOA or of my or of myself, um, of your of yourself, when it comes to how you got into role playing games and what made you stick. Right. Ooh. Um, how I got into it. Um, that's going back a fair few years. Um, I sort of got into it when I was about 13, 14, so like in the mid 80s, around um, right about 86, 87. Um, my uncle was only like two and a half, three years older than myself um, because there's a huge age gap between him and my mum. He got into uh, DD, so back then it would have been uh, first edition and like in the basic uh, like, and the red box set and stuff like that so the original uh dungeon master's guide that had the mm -hmm. scary demon the old satanic panic cover um and like i said he got into D, &D and like I say a group of group of friends in his age group and like myself and i'd always been a fan of uh tolkien and uh, read a few uh dragon lance novels and stuff at the time um that's how i got into it um so we, we started this little D&D group, uh, about five or six of us, and then two or three years later, we kind of evolved into LARPing and like, doing a, a system over here in the UK called Hero Quest. Which I'm, we then, I'm familiar with Hero Quest. Yeah, and we, we, we kind of made our own little spin off of it because um, we were all uh, World of Grey Oak fans. Um, mm -hmm. So, like my uncle Fred and like a few other people uh, decided to write their own own version of the game and. So, and that's what we did. So between LARPing and obviously role playing first edition D&D, &D, second edition, uh, uh, Role Master from uh, Iron Crane when it first came out, um, and pretty much everything from then onwards. Uh, so we tried everything from Vampire the Masquerade to Werewolf to Mage, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you tried back that? Up. Yeah, and to be honest, I loved it. I thought it was really good fun. I, I used to play, a, I, I almost always played a weasel with like a mega metabolism. So um, I spent most of my time uh, raiding shops and trying to eat literally everything I could, everything that I could find, um, living in McDonald's and, <laughs> and stuff like that, um, to one of my all-time favorites and something that we'll be playing on our own Twitch stream soon, Paranoia, um, which is just an in, insanely brilliant game. Uh, and in my opinion, probably the best written uh, game manual ever. Um, it's just hilarious from start to finish. Are you? Are you? On, I'm not entirely sure if you're only if you're only saying that it's the be, that it's the best written because because the computer might be watching you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No, but yeah, um, as an IT consultant, uh, I know the computer is always watching me. But no, I do. Um, I I just think it's a brilliant game. Uh, I love it. Um, and like I said, uh, uh, for me, it was like I said that was kind of my growing up and like I said I evolved with D&D from first edition I like, loved playing the original Assassin and, and classes like that I even remember the original um, I think it was the red box or the white box that um, when Dwarf was a character class it wasn't a race um, and stuff like that and mm -hmm. Tunnels and Trolls uh, again which I think is just a brilliant game <laughs> um, so little indie games like that uh, back then were world of rage because in the day even though TSR was this big thing in in our tiny little niche genre, um, it was still kind of an indie game, um, yeah. and I loved it. Like I said, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the original World of Grey Oak, uh, and like I said, having uh, played it not just on tabletop, but having lived through countless adventures um, in a live action role play sense. So being, being seeing some of your mates bringing the likes of Morden Kane and Rary and Nistel and Melf and Tensor and Tent on Nurev and and go to, to life and visiting place, places like uh, Homlet uh, and stuff like that. It was just brilliant. Um, and I think for me, some of the best 
D and D modules ever written come from a world of Grail, like Castle Grail and Temple of Elemental Evil, uh, mm -hmm. which is still rated, rated as well, probably one of the best dungeon crawls there ever was. Um, yep. uh, though some would say um, uh, Waterdeep, um, Under Mountain, and the like. Um, like I said, I played pretty much everything from, like I say, uh, un Ruins of Under Mountain to Ruins of Mithra and all. Um, and like I said, we, we did, we had a very broad spectrum, but for me, Grey Orc was where it was. And I kind of played all the way up to, I was about 2000 something. And I took a bit of a break because like you know, I said, life and work got in the way. And I spent a lot of time traveling, Norway, Sweden, Australia, a bit of time in the States and stuff. And it wasn't until I came back in like 2000, back to the UK, like 2015, 2016, that I kind of got back into role playing again. So luckily, I kind of disappeared from the role playing world around about three point five, um, and so I kind of completely missed fourth edition. So I'm quite happy about that, having gone back and looked at it. Um, I also it also meant I missed out missed things like the release of Pathfinder and fifth edition. Mm -hmm. So when I got back into into role playing and D and D etc., it was everyone was playing five E. Um, yeah. So. That was my first reintroduction uh, a couple of years ago, um, and to be honest, I didn't like it. <laughs> um, I found it very, shall we say, overbalanced. There was too much power in the players' hands. I didn't feel enough risk, or um, I, I certainly didn't feel that gritty, um, shall we say, sense of fear that you always had in first, in, like in first edition and stuff like that. Where mm. it wasn't until you kind of got to like level seven or eight that you can that she kind of got used to having a character um <laughs> i um when it when it comes when it comes to that kind of thing um i think D, i think dean i think um D, D will i'll probably i'll probably end up using that in my classes for years to come as an as an example mm -hmm. of why you need to specify what style of fantasy you're actually doing yeah um because the th if um if it was established early on that they were, that they were trying to go for more grit with their fantasy instead of go instead of going for um, higher ends of the spectrum, there probably wouldn't be that issue as much. I mean, you don't you don't see this issue with say Shadow of the Demon Lord or um, Conan Two D Twenty, or even or even the uh, Mongoose Conan D Twenty. Um, but those are built. Those are built with that particular playstyle in mind. So the the thing is that fantasy is a very wide net. Yeah, um, it is. Now, do you you mentioned you mentioned playing a a bunch of a bunch of different games? And one one thing that I've always been curious about, and may, maybe you can give some insight in this if you ever uh, touched on it. Um, are you were you familiar at all with Dragon Warriors? I'd heard of it, but it's not, it's not a system I played. Like I said, obviously yeah. being in the UK, we, we, cert we certainly didn't have uh, our disposal in the variety that you had in America. Um, obviously, like, uh, D and D and stuff, um, mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons and like TSR and hobby and game stores in America have been a bigger thing than they were in the UK. Uh, for example, Bristol, the town that I come from, mm -hmm. uh, say we go back to the 80s, I think there was only like one store that you could go to to buy D and D books. Yeah. That was it. Um, and uh, Bristol was a town of like half a million people. Yeah. Um, the The reason I bring up Dragon Warriors specifically is for years I had kept hearing that as as being referred to as the British AD and D. Um, like I said, um, no, I, like I said, I've heard of it, but like I said, it's not something we ever got around to playing. Yeah. But moving moving past that. Um, where where did the spark for um, Fires of Athelin really start really start out? What was the what was the opening journey towards towards originally, an idea into making uh, it a game? Yeah, okay. Originally, FOA mm -hmm. uh, began life as just a series of books. As I mentioned, I spent a lot of time traveling uh, with work as a consultant. Um, and like I said, these are back in the days, like the early two uh, thousands and. Like, and stuff like that before there were such things as internet on planes and trains and uh, airports and stuff like that. So to while away the time to stop myself from a getting very bored or drinking too much in uh, airport lounges and stuff like that, um, and doing some work, I decided to write. Obviously, I'd been a fan of um, 
uh, fantasy uh, uh, fiction novels for years. Raymond E. Feist, uh, Rob Salvatore, Rob C. Tolkien, um, like I said, the Wheel of Time books. I kind of devoured loads of them. Like uh, Feist, Medkemia World was um, as it is, is a huge influence on FOA as a whole. Um, you know, conceptually in some ways, and obviously the Bulgariad and, and David Eddings, etc. Um, mm-hmm. So I just decided to write. Um, they're horrendous. <laughs> Absolutely horrendous. In, in, um, I, I can say that, but it just occupied my time. So I created this world and NPCs and a storyline um, and stuff like that. Um, and when I was living in Sweden, uh, a group of friends of mine, uh, whilst I was in Gothenburg, uh, were looking at starting up their own um, uh, computer uh, com- uh, computer game studio, um, and they, eventually they did. Um, they went on to uh, create Stunlock Studios. Uh, they mm-hmm. created games like um, uh, Battle Champions and stuff like that. They eventually got bought out by Funcom, who did Age of Conan. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were looking at because I had this game world in my head of creating an MMORPG. Uh, this is kind of around about the time of the decline of. Uh, Dark Age Camelot, so circa 2006, 2007, about that time. Um, was, again, I was a big uh, DOAC player, um, something I really enjoyed, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what introduced me to my friends over in Sweden. Um, and so we gave it a go, and then we secured some investment and some finance to be able to, to get going, because obviously developing an MMO is a very costly uh, process um and then that's when the bubble burst the the world economy crashed and so FOA kind of got put on a shelf um but i'd already done a load of like um design work on the various classes the races and and i've gone through the process of converting the material i had in book form um into a a game structure so to speak um when I came back to the UK and I started um, getting involved in tabletop role playing again, um, the group I was involved with, um, the DM for work reasons, as most DMs do, uh, couldn't no longer run the game and run the session. So I said, All right, I don't mind. I've, said I've, I've got a little bit of experience now with fifth edition. It's not rocket science, it's very straightforward, even though there's a lot in here that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I'll run a, a one shot or like a, a little mini adventure if you guys want. And I'll set it in my own homebrew world because obviously I've got, I've got all the, the lore knowledge and the background knowledge of the, the, the FOA universe in my head. Um, so I said, yeah, sure, go for it. Um, and that one shot turned into like a mini adventure, which turned into a campaign. And whilst we were going through it, we started with the original like 5e classes, uh, so to speak. Um, but those classes didn't fit the world. It didn't make sense. So, like having a paladin um, being a storm knight or a dread knight of Auric, or um, the the cleric being pretending to be like a druid of uh, a druid, a disciple of Saloon, or a priest of Auric, or any of the other the other divine classes that we have just didn't work. They didn't, even though there were those those genre uh, stereotypes that they do kind of fit, but they didn't have that feel that I wanted. Um, so I started tweaking and changing classes, so to speak. And eventually we got to a point where I'd written a rule book. Um, <laughs> and then we, so we took fifth edition, threw it out the window, and we just started what was essentially our own homebrew game. Mm-hmm. And one of my, one of my players turned around to me and said, oh, yeah, um, stuff's actually quite good. Why didn't you try and publish it? <laughs> um, so that was it. That was kind of the snowflake that got the, the boulder rolling, so to speak. Um, and here we are two years later, um, going through a Kickstarter and probably three to four months away from potential release. Um, so from there, from one to the point when we threw fifth edition out, obviously there was a lot of crossover between 5e. I wasn't even aware at the time that there was a, a 5e open game license. Um, and certainly wasn't, had no intentions at that time of like publishing FOA. Um, and so two years later, and a, a lot of very late, and a number of sleepless nights later, um, we got to a point where we've got this dynamic game that, though it does ha- does hold the 5e open game license, that's only because it is a D20 system, mm-hmm. and there are like a do- 
maybe 20 to 25 spells left from first edition and those basic uh, fifth edition those basic core mechanics of action bonus action reaction the the, the 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 things that are common to all d20 systems no different to like 5e or pathfinder or any of the other d20 mechanics so there's any reason why the OGL license is in there outside of that every race every class um a couple of hundred skills all the talents um um all, hundreds of spells because uh, in foa all of our spell casting classes all 16 of them have unique spell lists so unlike other other d20 systems where kind of like Rome, uh, kind of like role master used to have where you even you had like a midwifery spell class i'm hope i'm hope spells. i'm hoping that um <laughs> when it comes when it comes to those spell lists they don't get as out of hand as role master's spell lists could get no um let, let's say um let's say the, the only the only like spells that will be familiar to people will be like the general magic arcane spells because they're the kind of wizard type the, the classic wizard spells like lightning mm -hmm. fireball etc invisibility and so forth but outside of that all of our arcane spell casting classes like the magus and furnace which is a bit warlockish certainly uh, a demonologist the type the ebon host which is a necromancer uh, the Weaver Gene, Weaver Dreams, which is a specialist illusionist and light magic spell casting class, and Amagus Elementus, which is your classic ele uh, elemental mage. Um, all those spells are unique to FOA. Um, and one thing, I'm, one thing I'm going to do is, um, as part of the OGL, is I'm going to make every spell in FOA part of the open game source. So yeah. even though I've, I've gone to the time of writing all these unique spells, I'm quite happy to share these with the rest of the 5e world. Now, um, when it now when it comes to when it comes to the design the 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 core aspects with the design, um, like right right early on in on the Kickstarter page, you talk you talk about adding a authentic combat system to add yeah. tactical and strategic aspects to D20. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious what the core pillars of that approach are going to be. Okay, um, one thing that um, e, this goes all the way back to the days of like first edition and original D&D. One thing that I always struggled with playing uh, what I call core health point systems, where you have a block of hit points and the objective is to reduce you to zero, was it didn't make sense. There was no attrition whatsoever. So even if you had 100 hit points or one, you are at 100% efficiency at one hit point. So there was no attrition to battle. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you've got arms and legs and say so with these core hit point systems, you can't target, up, for example, if you're fighting a dragon and the thing decides to take off, there's nothing you can do about it and apart from reduce it to zero hit points. Whereas I wanted a system that was a lot more authentic, a little more grittier and a lot more dangerous. Um, so in FOA, technically you can have your head cut off, which for most people is a bad day at the office. Um, or you can have a leg cut off or an arm cut off. You can find yourself cut in half. You can have your limbs broken and stuff like that because we've got a locational uh, hit point system. Um, so, for example, if you take uh, 10 point, somebody hits you with a long sword and you take 10 points of damage to your left leg, you simply reduce your hit points on your left leg by 10 and your total hit points by 10. So as you go, so we go back to that example of 100 hit points. So if your character has 100 hit points, by the time you've gone from that 100 down to one, because of the amount of damage spread out across your body in the various limbs and locations, the odds are you're going to be have a leg not functioning properly, wounded or broken. You're going to have an arm not functioning properly, wounded mm -hmm. or broken, or something's been cut off and you're bleeding to death because if you lose a limb, then you start to bleed. Um, mm -hmm. Or you've taken enough damage to your head to simply just knock you out. Um, so combat became a lot more authentic. And one thing that I really didn't like um, with, certainly with 5e, all the power and all the fun, ultimately, lay with spellcasters. Being a warrior in 5th edition is boring as hell. Oh, this, all you get, the all war, you get to do is... This is, the, this is a problem that's not, that is not new. I'd say, I'd say this is a problem that's been going on for yeah, years. Back, yeah, back to the beginning, because you had those core hit points. That was it. That's all you could do. You could swing your sword, do some hit points, add some color commentary, and that was it. Whereas spellcasters get to do all these marvelous magical things, but you as a warrior were just there to soak up hit points. You couldn't overtly 
affect combat other or other than a being the tank and drawing attention away so that your spellcasters and rogues can do all their fun and interesting stuff. You get to swing your sword a couple of times and then sit there and watch everyone else around the table be strategic or like cast fun spells and use certain abilities and stuff like that. So I wanted to create this combat system that was more balanced mm-hmm. so that those that were fighters could, those that like being fighters, who like being the warrior archetypes, who like being the roguish type archetypes, um, had the same kind of tactical capabilities that those people that use spells have. And it's not all about going, and spells in FOA aren't all about going boom. Um, there's a, a lot of number of spells uh, that like restrict movement and like uh, weld people's feet to the floor and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all about like crowd, there's a lot of like crowd control type spells, etc. cetera. Um, so that was like the essence of it. Um, and obviously having that locational hit point system and that attritional state in combat, combat becomes a lot more, what we call authentic, a lot more scary. Um, because, and certainly if you use some of the optional rules like um, our uh, critical injury tables, which are kind of a homage back to Rollmaster's uh, critical tables, not as complex or as um, intense and diverse. There are no small creature, tiny bite critical tables and stuff like that. There's mm-hmm. just a simple set of tables, which are kind of common. A lot of DMs over the years have created their own uh, injury tables and stuff like that. And But they're like optional rules you can bring in. Um, just to add some more flavor and injuries, you can break limbs, puncture lungs, um, cause nerve damage, cut out eyes, chop off arms and legs, uh, up to the point where you can even kill someone with a critical injury system. If you roll well enough, um, for example, if you roll two natural 20s in a row, there should be a reward for it. Um, and depending upon what type of creature you're fighting, mm-hmm. um, that will depend upon uh, the, shall we say, the grandeur of your of your role. I could say in our, our last episode, uh, Rob Presler, who plays Manny, the Storm Knight, rolled two natural 20s and killed a werebear in a single blow. Quite yeah. dramatic and, and quite fun. But the flip side is that can happen to you as well as yeah. a player. Um, <laughs> so, now, when it comes to, when it comes, when it, you mentioned role, you mentioned um, role master before, beforehand. And mm-hmm. of course, whenever role master is brought up, the thing that always comes to mind is the, um, infamous critical hit tables, um, <laughs> but even even with that, the the way combat ended up working in um, Rollmaster could be on the slow side with it just being with attacks that actually just did damage, not really meaning anything, and it was just a race to see who was going to do a critical hit first. Um, is that is is that something that you that you've considered that um. To in yeah, order, we, go ahead. Yeah, um, during during testing or during the like say um, a couple of the phases of testing, obviously we've mm-hmm. had, I've had campaigns with with groups of friends and stuff like that, uh, getting up to the uh, to the stage we are at the moment. We I actually spent like a, we spent a month where we kind of were just trying to work on a pure injury based system. So if you got hit, you took some kind of wound and stuff like that, but it just didn't work. Um, obviously, if something as a game designer you want to do is make sure that the game is accessible. Um, and with the greatest respect, I love Iron Crane, or I love Rollmaster and stuff like that. But if you go back to the late 80s, uh, early 90s and stuff like that, when it came out and it was popular, if you didn't have a degree in astrophysics, it was very hard to figure out what the hell was going on. Um, and so we wanted to make it simple. And though I don't want to sit here and bash 5th edition um, and the reasons why I ended up creating FOA as opposed to trying to play uh, 5e and making my world suit it. Um, one thing 5e does very, very well is it's simple and it's accessible. Um, so I kind of took those lessons on board. Um, I'm obviously not going to be proud enough to say oh, my game is the best game ever. So I took those lessons on board because I was using the 5e license. So right, if we keep that simple mechanic of hit points, but because we're using this locational hit point system, and there's a ratio involved in how your hit points are spread out across your body. Um, that made up that kind of difference. So it kind of melded like um, uh, Rollmaster and Fifth Edition and kind of rolled it all up into one. And made it a 
intuitive, so it was easy to understand and easy to, to play with, and B, simple enough, but giving that level of complexity to be able to give that grittier and authentic feel to combat that we were looking for. So you still have hit points, um, and you just, a normal blow will deliver a normal amount of hit points. For example, as mentioned, if you get hit with a longsword and you take 10 points of damage, then it's a simple case of deducting your hit that 10 points of damage from a the location it was hit and b your total hit points mm -hmm. um and if your total hit points reach zero then you go unconscious if your head reaches zero you go unconscious if your body reaches zero you go unconscious um if a limb takes enough damage it can be cut off so for example if your limb has 10 hit points and it goes to minus 10 um then it's come off and you severed and you start to bleed to death mm -hmm. um uh, you can take critical hit, uh, critical hits that just cause bleeding. There are um, skills and talents in the game that will allow warrior classes to cause bleeding injuries when they hit people. So that's like damage over time stuff. Um, so there are these little nuances and little layers on top. Um, those little complexities, um, so to speak, on top of like the old classic of... Um, uh, like I said, as, as you said, the role master is like, if you didn't do a critical hit, then you were just doing damage. Um, we still kind of have that model. If you don't do a critical hit, you're doing mm -hmm. damage, but because you've got these locationals and these locational ratios, um, it adds a different flavor to it. Yeah. Now, the ne when it comes to, when it comes to class design, um, now, a lot of a lot of times, one thing I've noticed with with a fair amount of um, third edition, not third edition, but um, fifth edition third party developers, is that a lot a lot of their editions, when it comes to the player end of the sandbox, lean more towards the creation of subclasses than full on classes. Um, would you say Would you say that the classes that you've got presented don't fall into that category? That they're they are fully realized classes and not um, subclasses of um, classes that already exist. Uh, they are, like I said, uh, though there are, like we've we've stuck with again the traditional archetypes: warrior, rogue, warrior, rogue, mage, and acolyte. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not we're not reinventing the wheel there. All of our classes are unique to the FOA world. Obviously, um, there's so much um, RPG content out there now um, that is practically impossible to be truly individual and truly unique. Mm -hmm. So they, it's, if you look at Pathfinder, you look at fifth edition, you look at most of the, the, the D20 systems, um, and you can draw parallels between most classes. And FOA is no different in that respect with some of our classes. Our disciples of assume you can draw parallels to um, the cleric, mm -hmm. um, and, but where our disciple of saloon differs is not though you've got the cleric and um the pathfinder equivalent etc where our disciple and priest classes differ is they're unique in their own right and they're very immersed in the foa world and universe um so the disciple of saloon and the uh priest of alric though they come from that same like stereotype so to speak they're individual in their own right and where um, FOA steps away from other D20 systems is we have uh, skill slots and talent, and talent points and stuff like that, which you can use to further um, evolve and develop and create your character in your own image. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of, right, you are, a, every disciple of Saloon has these skills, and that's it, everyone's the same. Um, though you have your class skills, which all disciples of Saloon will have, you also have like seven or eight skill slots, which in I think a huge list of not huge, but um, certainly not enough to be unwieldy. A large list of skills with which to be able to develop your character in your own image. The same thing goes with talents and stuff like that. Talents are kind of like feats, but we've tied them to your race to be part of your, like your natural talent, something that you are naturally talented at, as opposed to it all being tied to your character class. So we see we see things like talents being like a genetic capability. So your your race determines how many talents you get, and so it's not just stat bonuses and stuff like that. So your race becomes something that is 
involved in your character development from day one to the end. Um, mm -hmm. So we've tried, we've tried to keep that all going. So there, though there are um, genre stereotypes, and you can say, or, for example, the Shadow Stalker uh, rogue class is very much an assassin, um, but the Infiltrator is very much a charismatic um, uh, spy-type character. The Pathfinder is a, a little ranger-ish in nature. Um, the Spellblade is very much very much like a, a homage back to the original Thief Mage, um, though it's kind of more of a, uh, if you want to put it in 5e e terms, like a sorcerer, mm -hmm. um, being like uh, one of those bridges between uh, the arcane talents and general uh, general uh, combat classes like the rogues and the warriors, so to speak. So there are those stereotypes, but... All, the, all of our classes have much more customizational uh, options available to you. So it's not like um, we've taken the, 50, the 5e classes and then just turned them into our own unique. They're all very individual in nature. Um, and you have, whereas in 5e um, and like Pathfinder as well, you pretty much every level, you're just copying down what skill you get. Whereas in FOA, uh, pretty much every level, we're giving you the option to go and further evolve and develop your character as you wish. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to the, we meant you mentioned before. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I totally forgot. There's there's one mm -hmm. further advancement onto that. Oh. Um, there is um, we have a number of monstrous classes as well for GMs, which are optional to be able to be make available to characters. But these are classes that. Uh, GMs can use to um, use with monstrous races like the Kytian, which is kind of like a, an arachnid race or half giant or the hill giant or some of the other darker evil races, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a one advanced class, which is the sorcerer, which is totally sandbox. Um, and that is pretty, and the sorcerer has one skill at level one. And it states you can learn anything, you have a blank slate. As long as you as long as you learn the prerequisite of the skill before it, um, up to you. And again, this that that sorcerer template is there for GMs to go. Right, I've looked through these rule books. I've seen all these skills. They're really good. But my players want a sandbox game, mm -hmm. and we're giving you that template and the mechanic and tools to go. Right, here's the blank slate. Player's companion is all yours. Have fun. Yeah. Now. One thing I'm one thing I'm curious about, since you mentioned wanting to get wanting to make sure that mages didn't um, have all the fun, mm -hmm. is the is how how uh, martial characters are going to be diversified. Now I'm not now when I'm talking about this, I am specifically not discussing Gish characters, um, i.e. any any sort of any sort of class or any sort of build that would be doing both um physical combat as well as using magic that's um i'm focusing on people who who if they wanted to be a pure martial character um what what would be what would be some of the means that they could do to express their particular fighting style aside from their equipment right um in uh in FOA, as i said um so you have a set you Depending on what class you take, for example, we'll, we'll take the Guardsman, which is one of our heavy tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, your classic, your class, he is your classic tank for all defense purposes. Um, his class skills are uh, built around being protective and being able to protect him uh, or him or her. Um, uh, and then you have those skill slots with which you can evolve and develop your character with. And within the, within like the warrior skill set, the warrior skill lists, etc. Even though you're not restricted to your archetypal skill list, you can learn something from anywhere else as long as you, you understand, and as long as you have the prerequisite for that skill. Some skills have a, a archetype based prerequisite. For example, if you want to learn the skill precision, which allows you to target various locations, then you have to have a, enough of understanding in combat. So, three levels of warrior or three levels of rogue archetypes. Um, and so, you've got things like that. So. Warriors get to learn, certainly learn a, a lot faster than the mages who have spell precision later on, access to spell precision later on. So they get to use the locational combat system much quicker. 
Um, there's things like um, trip attack and dirty fighting and, when, and cheap shot and stuff like that, which allows warriors to do that extra little bit of damage. Um, there's all sorts of little nuances and little skills that warriors can take um, to give them different fighting styles or do a little bit more damage, like two weapon, two handed weapon proficiency that allows you to do extra extra damage with your weapon and stuff like that. So we, I took a, a great deal of time in giving warriors and rogues, and, and certainly the rogues as well. Again, like I said, I go back to the days that I used to love the first edition assassin. So mm -hmm. most of the rogues have access to either herbalist skills and poison skills and stuff like that. And in FOA, there's a huge list of various poisons and things that you can attempt to brew. Same thing with the herbalist skills and stuff like that. So you had a lot more utility, and there's nothing mm -hmm. stopping a warrior from learning it. Uh, spending a skill sort on um, learning how to use a poisoner's kit or learning how to become a herbalist and brewing their own potions and concoctions and evolving, developing. And all those rules are in the Games Master's Companion yep. to give the players to have fun with. So mm -hmm. I wanted to give them a lot more utility and versatility so they weren't just swinging swords and stuff like that. And a lot of that um, evolves as well into uh, monster creation and rules for various monsters and stuff like that. So that um, a lot of creatures in FOA have a resistant to like at least one type of of weapon, so that it it kind of forces forces your hand, so to speak, to be a little more versatile. Um, you can go for the min max build if you wish, but the way that FOA is structured, you are going to put yourself at a disadvantage by going all in one direction and not not making yourself versatile enough to deal with what's going to happen and all the various nuances that come later on. Yeah. Now, I want to shift into ma into uh, magic use for a bit. Now, would it be fair of me to assume that you are that you have no intention of using the um, spells per day approach? No, um, we have that we don't we have no spell slots. Um, we don't even have um, a, a spell learning system similar with um, other systems, uh, as far as uh, FOA is concerned, uh, there are two, there are, well, technically there are three, but in the Player's Companion, there are two sources of uh, magic, uh, arcane magic and divine magic. Mm -hmm. so if you're an arcane caster, you tap into the manner of the universe um, and manipulate it as you wish, by setting, casting fireballs or calling down divine power to heal your friends, and so, so to speak. Um, and depending on how many levels of arcane caster or, or, or how many levels of mage you have in your character build, how many levels of acolyte you have in your character build, will determine the size of your mana or power. So mages have mana, and acolytes have power, um, and you are free to cast whatever you want within your spell repertoire up until the point you run out of mana or power. Yeah. Now... When it, you you mentioned you mentioned not having a um spe, you mentioned not having a spell list is it a case is it a case where um play, where players are are going to be having the option to create spells on the fly or something? Um, it's, that, that's sorcery, and I'll, I'll get into sorcery in a second. Um, when I say I'm not having spells, low, low classes have their individual spell lists. For example, mm -hmm. gods have specific spell lists, and depending upon whether you're a disciple of Saloon, a priest of Elric, a earthwork druid, a druid of valor. A ghost, of, uh, a ghost of Femrin or a Spirit Shaman, a Storm Knight or a Dread Knight, whatever, then um, your spell list is determined by your god. Um, and um, whether you're, depending upon what school of magic you belong to as a mage, um, your spell list is determined by your school. But we don't restrict you to levels of spells. Though levels exist as standard, like levels one to nine with cantrips, so it's actually zero to nine. Mm -hmm. um, when you become a mage for the first time, you are capable of attempting to learn any spell of any level within your class. Because um, as far as we're concerned, magic is magic. If it's written down in a book, you're probably capable of learning it. So we have a spell mastery system, which is built into our organic character development, which we can touch on a little later, and skill mastery, etc. cetera. Um, so though you're a first level mage, there's nothing stopping you apart from your GM being an idiot. Uh, for you attempting to learn the spell wish. Um, 
you can attempt it. Um, it's obviously going to be very difficult because there is a high DC. Um, so um, it's to learn the spell, and there's nothing stopping you from attempting to cast it. Um, apart from the fact that attempting failure to cast a wish spell at first level is likely to kill you because um, you simply aren't capable of controlling that much ma that much pa that much magic. And certainly at first level, you don't have enough mana to cast a spell anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So we, 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 we've certainly made sure. So as a mage or as an acolyte, you, have, you pick your spells at first level. And then it's a case of going off into the world, meeting new people, finding new spells and scrolls and stuff like that, and then filling out your spell books or your prayer books and stuff like that. So um, I was never a fan of this concept of I gain a level, I learn two new spells. No, just off you go, mm -hmm. out into the world, learn magic. Yeah. So and since you since you brought it up, that's a good that's a um I'd say that's a good enough um invitation to segue into it. So let's talk about the amusingly acronymed O C D, organic character <laughs> development. Yeah. I, I have to come up with a better one before release. <laughs> but we've kind of, it's, kind of, it's kind of grown on us by now. Um, yeah, um, I've, I've, never been a, I've never been a fan of the way that a, a lot of GMs um, use leveling up and the concept of, like, you go out, you kill, some, you kill some beasties, you pick some locks and you do all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, you, you're sat in the middle of a forest and your GM turns around, oh, by the way, you've got enough XP now, you're now third level. And you've learned a load of skills while sitting around a campfire. Um, so I took the brave step of taking the entire concept of experience points and throwing them away. Um, and I spent some time sitting down and trying to develop a system where your character's growth and development is interwoven into the story. Um, so you get to feel your character grow. You get to um, take those steps with them rather than leveling up always being this case of Right, you've leveled up, or you, for example, if you're using milestones, you've completed your adventure, you spent a month in downtime, and off you go. So I came up with this organic organic character development and the concept of skill mastery and spell mastery. So essentially, when you start your character at first level, or whatever level you want to decide you're going to start, um, you then have to go out into the world and find someone to teach you your next skill. Mm -hmm. um, you spend a little time, for example, uh, we'll go back to our friend, guard, uh, our, our guardsman friend, we'll call him Bob. He's level one and he wants to learn uh, two handed weapon proficiency so he can do a bit more damage with his uh, great axe or his two handed sword. Um, so he needs to go off into the world, find someone that has that skill, which kind of puts a little onus on the, on the games master to write someone like that into the storyline for them. So you're now starting to get a lot of player and GM interaction. Um, so to speak, so you're constantly having that narrative with your players, okay, what skills are you going to learn at this next level? And as a GM, you're kind of fitting them into the storyline. Um, and you spend a little bit of time in-game trying to learn your skill from your, your character. And when we started our stream, uh, we did a prologue, which is like the first four episodes of um, Fires of Earthling and Shadow Awaken on our Twitch channel, which are all now up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the origin story of our players, where they, where Musa, became, Musa met the guy, uh, Corporal Collins, that taught him to become a path, uh, taught him to become a pathfinder. Where Kada met Saran, who introduced her to um, Darakos and becoming a ghost of Femrin and stuff like that. So we got to play through the characters learning their skills and going through that organically, as opposed to it all being dumped into downtime. And the players loved it. Um, it was a, it was a really good concept, and because we got these skill mastery and spell mastery mechanics that are built into organic character development to allow you to do it. So you go off, you learn your skill. You can then, during a little bit of downtime or when your character stops for the night, as a camp, or you wake up in the morning, two warriors and warrior types in the party decide that they're going to start sparring. The mage starts practicing their spell. So you kind of feel that gap out because I've mm -hmm. always felt like certainly, certainly since um, getting back into the game and watching a lot of Twitch streams that there was a lot of adventures a lot of adventuring missing um, that you were just going from 
one encounter, one fight to the next, a bit of talking to the next fight. It was very, it's like, well, what's happening in the middle? Where's the adventuring? Where's the, right? okay, yeah, it might take two weeks to go from town A to town B, mm-hmm. but there's nothing, there's nothing within the systems for those players to do in those two weeks. So you, as a GM, you have to fill it with random encounters and uh, organic character development and that skill mastery system is kind of a way to give players tools with which to be able to fill those two weeks so they can say, oh, whilst we're traveling between town A and town B, we're going to do some sparring and practice my spells to try and, and develop and get a little bit more skill mastery or spell mastery in my spells mm-hmm. or in my skills, so to speak. And you can only gain a certain amount through practice. The rest has to be gained under duress, so in battle, so to speak, or if you're, or if you're trying to learn lock picking skills as a rogue um, or as a warrior, so to speak, um, then it has to be under duress. So you have to be trying to actively break into somewhere and you've got to pass your skill mastery checks, so to speak. So it all became very organic. So we tied character development into the story. Oh, I hope, I hope, all right. I hope, I hope you understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, something I'm, something I'm curious, of, I'm curious about is when... Um, when I when I see the the notion of um tactical um aspects um would it be fair of me to say that hit that hit location is going to be emphasized in this game? Uh yeah um so um pretty much everything uh any spell that does, well any spell that does damage um or any physical attack whether it's uh, a bow shot or an axe swing or a, a punch or a kick from anyone. Or, or even in the case of like some of our cla- our races like the Orgat or the um, which are quite trollish in, uh, trollish in accuracy or nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally they were going to be called trolls, but then my lawyers turned around to me and said I can't do that. Um, <laughs> so we called them called them Orgat. Um, they have natural weapons, so you can bite people um, or claw people. And again, there there are ways to build character classes where you can enhance your natural weapons so you're not limited to swords you can be very much build a martial class where you can go out and be very pri- uh, primal and savage and claw and rip and bite people to death um which one of my players found to be very enjoyable um but yeah they said it said it, it the, the locations are done like any spell that has a um attack function into it. So if you've got to make a spell attack roll, whether it's touch or range, will cause damage to a location. Um, and, and that works exactly the same way as if you were hitting someone with a sword. Um, and there are skills like precision and spell precision, and stuff like mm-hmm. that, that allow you to target where you're going to deliver your blow. Um, so for example, we go back to the, the analogy I used earlier um, of the dragon taking off and flying away. In FOA, if it does that, then there's nothing stopping your warrior pull, pulling out his crossbow or your mage summoning up um, a spell and targeting his wings and bringing a little ship back down to earth where you can chop him up. Um, so there is that tactical element. Um, and the same thing, you can target a creature's leg. If you, can, if you can wound a creature's leg, reduce it to zero hit points where it's not functionable anymore. You reduce their movement speed. Um, if you're fighting a guy that's got a two-handed sword, and you wound one of its arms, his arms, so that it's not working anymore. It can't use that sword. Um, there was a good example in one of our recent adventures of shows, which is a little one-on-one with me and some NPCs and guests that have come mm-hmm. in, so that people can see. Where if you target um, a guy's shield arm, you can reduce his armor class, thus making it easier for you to hit him uh, and stuff like that. So there was that. Those there are those tactical nuances that come into combat, even though. Even though it is those hit points, it's where those where that damage is delivered makes a difference. Uh, and again, that and that's what that's what develops part of the attritional nature of um, combat in FOA. So, mm-hmm. so we go back to that 100, 100 to one hit point scenario. Um, by the time you've gone from one hundred to one, you will have lost the use of a a leg or an arm, or you've taken enough damage to your body to knock you out, or you've taken enough damage to your head to render you unconscious and stuff like that. Um, so combat becomes very tactical. Obviously, the prime target is somebody's head, but to specifically target a head, a creature's head, 
Um, there are penalties that go with it because every creature in the world that has a brain in its head, if you take a swing at their head, they will instinctively move their head. Um, so we've got that authentic realism that comes into it as well. So hitting someone, specifically trying to hit somebody in the head, is a little harder than trying to hit somebody somewhere else because naturally, say if I was to take a swing at your head, you would attempt to duck. Whereas if I was to take a swing at your body, you might decide, okay, I'm going to try and suck it up and I'll take that blow. And when it comes now, when it comes to the when it comes to the books formats, because I think you, I think it was mentioned that you're shooting for four books total when it comes when it comes to this. Um, what technically, would... uh, technically, to get started, you only need the two: the player's companion and the games mm -hmm. master's companion. Yeah, because um, there's the there, there's enough rules in the games master's companion for any game any GM to start building their own monsters. Mm -hmm. um, so to speak, because the uh, Games Master's Companion is pretty much full of all the rules that I've used to build the game. I'm pretty much handing everything over to you on and saying, right, it's your game now. Mm -hmm. Have fun. Um, these are all the rules. This is everything in there. I'm not, uh, everything is, everything in here is optional. Feel free to tweak, tailor. And as it says a couple of times in the FA, in the Games Master's Companion, if you don't like it, feel free to throw it out the window and make it up yourself. Yeah, because um, <laughs> that's that's my opinion on GMing. Um, it is your game. Uh, the way I run a game will be completely different to the way that you run a game, and the same thing that like Matt Mercer and anyone else runs a game. Mm -hmm. As individuals, we're all unique. Um, and the way I've seen other other D twenty system rule books laid out, they're very strict in what they say. This is how it's done. This is this. This is that. This is that. Um, and it's kind of like very raw Nazi it's Nazi ish, if you get my meaning. Yeah, I, I want the I want um, it to go. Yeah. The ter the phrase that the phrase that I've come to that I've come to utilize a lot is um designed by gospel. Yeah. Um uh, I have a, what I call the, the four core core tenets of FOA. Mm -hmm. Um empowerment, I want to empower you the GMs and you the play players to feel in control of your characters and in control of your game and everything in FOA is kind of designed along that lane that line I didn't it's one of the things I don't like about fifth edition is though it's very simple and it's very easy to build a character um, there's no thought process going in there pretty much every warrior is the same or um, every eldritch knight's the same every champion's the same every mm -hmm. um, uh, every battle master's the same they're there's no difference. The only difference that you have is the flavor that you add and the background story that you as a player add. Whereas I wanted to empower players to be able to, though all the, we'll use our guardsmen example again, though all guardsmen have the same class skills, you have so much more creative license in the number of skill slots and talent slots you get. To, so that not every guardsman is the same. Not every legionnaire is the same. Not every shadow stalker assassin is the same. Not every pathfinder is the same. They're all different. Um, and by my reckoning, each class has around about 20 to 25 viable builds. Um, and even during testing, players were coming up with builds and ways to evolve and develop characters that I hadn't even thought of whilst designing them. Um, and and so, so that was it. That was the empowerment and creative license, which is the essence of the Games Master's Companion, giving you all the tools you need to understand FOA. Um, mm -hmm. We break it down with the NPC creation guide, how to quickly build NPCs. Obviously, having being the designer and the creator of the game, I'm at a point now where my players can easily start a fight anywhere they want, and I can, in, off the top of my head, just create an encounter. And that's the type of empowerment by having these flexible rules. So I'm not so, as a GM, I'm not tied to stat blocks. I don't have to go, wait, or oh, how many hit points has a bandit got? Uh, what's he do? I can just go, right, okay, I've got this familiarity with the system. And it guides you through that familiar, uh, familiar, familiarizing process mm -hmm. so that you as a GM are empowered to unleash your, create, your creativity. So games become a lot more free flow and you're not caught within that as you said, that um, rules by gospel, so to speak, 
they're all free form and pretty much everything that's in the games master's companion is optional um and it, it and hell, even the locational combat system is optional if you don't like it just use a a standard core hit points it's, it's up to you it's your game in the end of the day um i'm not going to come around and say well no you that's, that's not how you do it um this is a world in a game where i'm handing over that creative license to you the players even not the way um, we've structured our adventures they're not written in the standardized way whereas right here's the original blurb we will give you the plot we will give you the plot devices like uh, names of npcs a little bit of background and stuff like that um we'll give you a map um and then we leave it down to you the gm to create your adventure um so we pretty much give you all the tools that fit with all the tools that are in the games master's companion um and off you go so we've got mm -hmm. the npc creation guide we've got the monster creation guide which is the game master's companion and as mentioned earlier um there's a lot of uh Mekinia and raven and vice influence so um there's a lot of infernal and demonic um influence in the foa universe and so we've got this wonderful thing called the build a better demon wizard mm -hmm. where you can take pretty much any creature you like stick it into the end of the build a better demon wizard and out pops a, a nice shiny demon at the other end um and because the way that demon it's structured um as you go through various phases depending on what level demon you want um and, and you can pick or randomly pick by rolling dice um various skills depending upon the level of demon each demon that comes out the other end is unique so encounters their encounters themselves become unique so you're not going into an encounter going oh it's five bandits and they're all their stats because in foa that's kind of impossible because we don't have these stat blocks uh, we've got a few which are in the back of the games master companion for things like bears and lions and tigers etc um the, the types of things that players can turn into but even those are flexible which the G, which gms can quickly and easily manipulate in their manipulate to give them their own stats um mm -hmm. so that was the creative license and that kind of ties into so we've got the empowerment we've got the creative license we've got the immersion like i say all our classes etc all tied into the foa world and universe um and the last one is fun i mean certainly from talking to everyone that's played FOA from and not everyone has enjoyed it I'll, I will say that from day one some people who were very hardcore 5e D, &D guys mm -hmm. didn't like it uh, admittedly back then uh, FOA was probably a lot more complex and that's where I said I learned the lessons where what 5e did very well was it was simple um, so I kind of reined in the complexity of character creation um, that was in, in the original versions um, and kind of evolved from there to OCD and ought to be fun. And from my perspective, and I'm quite happy going on record in this, I'm not Wizard of the Coast. I'm not building a game to satisfy millions of people. Ultimately, I'm building a game for that my friends and I will enjoy playing. And hopefully everyone else and other people will enjoy playing as well. But ultimately, it needs to be fun for me because I'm not going to go through this entire process um, and not enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so it needs to be something that I find enjoyable and my friends find enjoyable. And like I said the vast majority of them, apart from a couple who were hardcore D and D guys, um, enjoy. It. They they like the, the grittier nature and stuff like that. And we've like said, got some excellent highlights on our Twitch stream of some of our players saying, "Every time I play this game, every time I get hit, I just panic and I'm filled with a sense of dread." Uh, which, is, which from my perspective is brilliant that's the type of thing you want in combat is that authentic feel i i kind of meandered a bit there but um hopefully that kind of filled out for you yeah now in the now um when it comes to when it comes to the custom content or a cut or a customization in that in that guide um is advice for class creation also in that you can build everything from races to classes. I give you the tools for everything. You, the tools to create um, the the third and fourth book, the campaign companion, mm -hmm. gives you all the rules to create your own world. It gives you background on things on creating uh, monarchies or 
mage archies and and being able to create your own continents and create your own factions. Um, so it gives you those guidelines. Um, it also gives you uh, rules, on, gives you out, not rules, but outlines and guides on how to create your own gods and create your own spell lists and being able to populate your own world. Because the, one of the things about the FOA universe and its backstory is um, the eternal darkness, Darakos, um, mm. and his children, the ancient ones, effectively demonic gods, so to speak, are marching across the universe, devouring worlds as they go. And Athelene is a world in it. Um, and so I want GMs to be able to, and homebrewing is important, vitally important. And um, as much as I, I look forward to the time of being able to hopefully watch on Twitch other people playing in the world of Athelene, um, I want them to be able to create their own worlds in the FOA universe. So all those mm -hmm. rules are in the Game Master's companion. And the Monstrous Encyclopedia, which is the fourth book, is pretty much a list of rules for creating some, pretty much any creature you like. Um, it'll have some background and some of the basic ones, like I said, lions, tigers, and bears. Uh, it covers um, our, what we call our natural states. Uh, for example, for us, vampirism and uh, lycanthropy, uh, like vampires and lichens, are natural, naturally occurring creatures in the FRA universe. And as such, the rules exist for your players to be able to play vamp vampires or lichen. Um, and much like anything in FOA, if we give you something, there's a balance to go with it. Um, huge fan of, like, if I give you something good, there's going to be a downside to go with it, I'm afraid, mm -hmm. to keep it balanced. Um, and so you've got things like that. And uh, the Lichdom states that characters could, mage type characters or acolyte type characters can attempt to come liches. Um, we have hero abilities, which again, one of our customizational options, which are um, after 15th level, you stop learning class skills. And our hero abilities are effectively you creating your own bespoke skill in combination with your GM. Obviously, has a, a weight and balance type of thing. So at 16th level, our 16th level guardsman, mm -hmm. Bob, um, turns around and says, OK, because um, I took like, uh, I want to learn my own weapon style. I want to learn my own trick and stuff like that. So you, all the rules are there for you to be able to create these skills with your players. Um, and that gives you that level of customization to go with it as well. Um, and much like everything else, we, we wanted to, I wanted to try and make everything as customizable as possible so that you, the player, and you, the games master, feel in control of your game. And you're not just regurgitating my stuff. Mm -hmm. It's your game. That's that's the ultimate emphasis. It's yours. Um, as soon as you buy the book, it's all yours to play with and do with as you wish. Yeah. Now, as far as the page count of the uh, of each book, where where would you say the estimate would be at for them? Okay, the the games master, the player's companion is the biggest one, um, mm -hmm. and that's three hundred and eight pages. And that's because we. That's pretty much because of the spell compendium. And depending on, and in the end of the day, uh, the way we've structured our spell compendium, uh, a lot of people will enjoy this, is it's structured per spell list. So depending upon what casting class you've taken, you're not going to spend countless hours thumbing through spells lists, trying to find everything in alphabetical order. Um, and you simply just have to stick a bookmark in at your particular spell list, and off you go. That's it. It's very simple. So um, then we have... Uh, the spell companion takes up an awful lot of the book. Um, the games master's companion is around 205 pages. Campaign companion is about uh, 200 pages as well. And the monstrous encyclopedia is quite small in comparison. It's about 160. Mm -hmm. And so, with and in, in in that in all four cases, it's something that um at the very least i'm going to be looking forward to when the time comes yeah um and like i said the style of them we've decided to go uh, i'm kind of um it wasn't i wasn't aware that 3.5 kind of did the same thing but i kind of stylized in old uh, as, as if they were old tomes and the mm -hmm. way that they were written and the way that they are illustrated as well um it's as if um a writer was describing or at least documenting documenting the game so they look like, as you, as you've seen from the, the pictures I've sent you, they look like spellbooks. Yeah. The, end of the day, um, and 
as is one of our Kickstarter rewards. Um, we've got leather bound, special edition leather bound versions um, that are available for our Kickstarters. And uh, depending upon how many of those versions are, uh, are get shipped off during our Kickstarter, then we may have some left over to be available for our limited edition first print run. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and putting up with the um, technical failings that we had today. <laughs> no um, problem. And 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 of course, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, um, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, there's actually one thing I forgot, mm -hmm. to, I, I forgot to mention when we were talking about um, magic. Yep. And that's our sorcery system, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of our crown jewel, so I shouldn't have forgotten about it. I'm afraid. I do apologize. Um, no and as I, as I mentioned, the sorcerer cast is very sandbox, mm -hmm. and sorcery is our unique magic system. It allows you to, as you, as you asked, to literally create magic at the tabletop. Anything that you are capable of imagining in your head, you are capable of manifesting it on, on the game. There is a structure and a rule system that you go through, depending upon what you're trying to do, then your GM determines a uh, DC. Um, the, the the best way for people to get their head around it, if they've ever read it, the Bulgaria, the will in the word, um, mm -hmm. type, that type of thing. So anything that uh, Bulgari, uh, Bulgarath or Bulgari, uh, Bulgarian or po uh, Polgara, et cetera, could think of, um, they were capable of manifesting and making it happen. And that's kind of our sorcery system. Um, we've got a mechanic in place that as long as you succeed on your uh, sorcery check uh, to be able to bring your your will and your sorcery to bear, then you're not limited by what we call prescribed spell lists, not limited by what you've got in your spell book. You are literally creating magic at the tabletop, um, and it works very, very well. And though that seems very powerful, certainly in the hands of the Sorcerer cast, which is, again, quite power powerful due to its um, very sandbox nature, um, we do have those checks and balances. So if you fail your uh, sorcery check, you will develop fatigue and make, thus making uh, manifesting your will harder. Every time you fail, that fatigue gets even worse. So you get larger penalties to your, your any future checks if you fail by a certain amount, then you suffer what's known as sorcerer's feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively the universe pushing back against you because the universe is a very fickle beast. She doesn't like being played around with. Um, and you are then, for all intents and purposes, at the mercy of your GM. So, for example, if you were trying to polymorph a dragon into, an, into a squirrel um, and you failed your sorcery check, um, your GM is completely within their own rights to turn you inside out if they feel like it. Uh, which it could be about to hit the office, or you can take simple things like psychic damage, which is just damage to the head, or you can teleport yourself to another world, or um, fire a lightning bolt off and hit one of your friends. So you're completely at your DM's mercy. So mm -hmm. um, as powerful as sorcery is, there are those checks and balances, and that um, ultimate dread of or threat of feedback sitting there. Um, for those sorcerers that try to overextend themselves and bend the universe to their will, um, mm -hmm. and it is, it is in in my certainly in my case. Um, obviously, I hope somebody out there will will get in touch and tell me I'm wrong. It's something I've never seen anywhere in a role playing game where you have complete free form control to create magic at the table. Um, I've seen a few instances, but it's but it is um, relative. It is relatively uncommon. Um, mm -hmm. Like when I think of it, I think of Pathfinder dipped into it a little bit. Um, Alpha Omega has ha has done it, um, and um, Anima did it with its um, key system. Although although it it also had a tr also had a more traditional magic magic approach as well, but Anima go goes in a lot of different directions. So. There, it's one. It's one of those things where it's. I'm not gonna. Say, I'm not gonna say it's um, a brand new thing, but it's definitely something that isn't dipped into as often as it could have been. Um, and it, it's like from from all of our testing, it works, works very well. Like I said, having those checks and balances in place certainly keeps sorcerers in check. 
Um, and again, it being an optional rule, and it was kind of what I wanted from FOA from day one, as far as magic was concerned. Mm-hmm. But it took me so long to get to the point where I was comfortable with the balance of sorcery. I'd already written 400 odd spells and I wasn't going to just throw them away. So <laughs> sorcery became this optional or advanced system that the ends can quite happily, if they want, throw the spell compendium part of their player's companion away and just play with sorcery. Um, and again, that's, that, that's part of the customization side of it. But the sorcery is like our crime jewel. Um, we had a sorcerer in our Twitch campaign until he got himself kidnapped. Um, <laughs> just don't trust players with fun characters that's all i can say <laughs> yeah um but but if but with that with that said again i do i do mm-hmm. want to give my thanks for for uh, coming on um and of course a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness and there'll be plenty Indeed. more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but Indeed. until for... oh go ahead I just, I just say thanks for having me yep, yep. <laughs> But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!